Well, glad you're here. Um, my family and I, we celebrated my son's 11th birthday this past week. Um, yeah, good for him. Um, I, it's when the kid, I have an 11 year old and a nine year old, and it's weird, I keep thinking I'm still in my early 20s. Um, but when you have an 11 year old, you're like, that's not right. So um, I'm getting, every time he gets older, I'm like, man, I'm getting older. And so, um, but we had a wonderful week of celebration. But as, y- as you do, um, generally, when my kids have a birthday, Sarah and I reminisce on 11 years ago. We reminisce on, man, you remember that first day in the hospital with this little guy. Um, you know, he was our firstborn. So we had just this kid, and, and, and it's wild, and I did way less work than my wife did for that. Um, but at the hospital, um, I realized, like, I had never held a baby. I had never changed a diaper. I had never done really anything with babies. And all of a sudden, I'm a dad, and they're like, here's your child. And you're like, whoa. Um, and there's something really comforting about being at the hospital, because there's tons of nurses, and any question you have, they're, they're not worried about anything. Um, and you're worried about everything. And, and so I had so many questions about, you know, his feet looked a little chapped and I was wor- really worried about that. And they're like, just relax and all this stuff. And then finally, you know, the doctor comes in and is like, hey, we're sending you home today. And you're like, like, are you coming with us? Like, <laughs> like, like, what do you mean you're sending us like, what? And they're like, yeah, well, you know, here you go. And, and then you, you take this little baby and, and they give you about a three-page brochure on emergency numbers to call just in case. But they're like, here. And, and you take a human being home with you. And they act like it's totally normal. <laughs> um, if you've bought a new car, they spend more time telling you what to do with this car <laughs> than a human being. Like I have, a, we were fortunate to buy a new car two years ago. They give you a 700 page manual on, on how to take care of this car, on what to do in case lights go on, everything. Human being, they're like, you'll be fine. <laughs> like have you, have you ever realized the, the, the fact that your parents, mom, dad, whether you met them or not, you grew up in a lovely home or not, your parents raised you and, and they never had to answer the question, what is a human being, to even take you home? You, you're just brought into this world and it's somewhat assumed that someone's going to tell you at some point what you're doing here. I remember being at a park in Kensington when we lived down in San Diego. I was talking to a mom there. She, she was our neighbor. She was a friend. And she knew we were Christians. And she said, are you going to raise your kids Christian? I was like, yeah, we're planning on, on doing that. And I said, what do you, what do, what's your, you know, she was kind of agnostic, atheistic. I was like, what, do you, what are your thoughts? She was like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to impose my views on my child. I'm going to let them figure it out. And I was like, the kid who's eating sand and pinching my son, like you're going to let him figure out what the purpose of, of the world is. And, and that's what many of us do though. It's what many of us experienced growing up, that, that you just came into this world, no one told you who you are, what you're doing, why you're here, and then we suffer a meaning of crisis and, and we have no idea what to do with it. Today we're gonna look at page one again of the Bible. We're in a series on Genesis, and and fortunately, Genesis 1 tells us why we're here. Genesis 1 tells us what it means to be a human being. Genesis 1 tells us why you actually have meaning and purpose in your life, and it's not something that you and I created, but the Creator God gave us. So if you have a Bible, run over to Genesis chapter 1. If not, we're going to have it up on the screen. And today, we're, we're really going to be at answering the question, what is a human being? Like, like what are you? Who, who are you? It, it may sound like a, a, an odd question, but if you don't have an answer to this question, life is going to be far more difficult than it needs to be. 
like, why are you here? And by God's grace, he has told us why. So Genesis chapter 1. We're going to, uh, we've been in Genesis for a couple of weeks. We're going to finish out chapter 1 today and get into chapter 2. Um, and, and, and a couple of weeks ago, we looked at God, who God is. And, and today really is who, who is, who is man, who is woman, who is human. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Man there is humanity. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. Okay. So let's pause for a moment. We're, we're going to read quite a few verses today, but instead of just throwing it all at you, we'll just read a little bit, break it down. On page one of the Bible, written some 3,500 years ago, there is a revolutionary claim that men and women together are made in God's image. That there is full equality between man and woman. Page one of the Bible. I studied philosophy uh, in college and and we'd we'd study, you study history and things get pretty wonky when it comes to inequality between men and women. Um, Some of the most influential philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, dudes we talked about every day in class. Brilliant, brilliant men. I mean, some of their ideas we're still, we just still wrestle with. As brilliant as they were, they, they held views on women and inequality that, that were quite disturbing. Um, I think it was Plato who believed that women were reincarnated men who had lived poor lives. Aristotle believed that, that women were, were incapable of rational thinking. And so every day in philosophy class, if you ever wanted to disagree with Aristotle and Plato, that's all you had to use. You're like, are these the guys who think women are inferior? It's like, yeah, those are the guys. So, and this isn't just Aristotle and Plato. This is the vast majority of human history thinking. And yet here on page one of the Bible, God goes, you're both equal made in my image. It's remarkable. Verse 28. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. Shout out to the vegetarians. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky and for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. God creates man and woman in his image, and then he gives them a task together. He doesn't say, all right, woman, I'm going to give the man his job. He has man and woman and goes, be fruitful multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over it to both man and woman. We're seeing what it means to be made in the image of God. He, he, he finally says on day six, he's been saying it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. On day six, when he makes humans, he goes, it's very good. Humanity is, is in, in, in some sense, the pinnacle of God's creation. And, and then he creates 
trees and plants and fruits for, for humans. And it does seem like the earliest humans were vegetarians. It's not until Genesis 3 that we start killing animals and eating them. Some pros and cons there. Um, let's keep reading. Chapter 2, verse 1. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. Okay, we already talked about this a little bit last week. Seventh day of creation, God rests. It's not because he's tired, but he's, he's, he's ruling from his throne. He's saying everything that was chaotic is now in order. And because everything is in order, I can rest. And so he rests on the seventh day. And as we see later in the scriptures, there is a picture that we're invited into the same Sabbath rest, okay? But let's keep going. Verse four. Um, so this, this is, yeah, we'll read it and then I'll unpack. Verse four. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. At the time that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet grown on the land and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not made it rain on the land and there was no man to work the ground. But mist would come up from the earth and water all the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. Okay, this is where we have to remember a little bit of what I talked about last week. If you missed it, go listen to it. Things get a little confusing. Page one, page two, Genesis one, Genesis two. You have the creation account in Genesis one where God, seven days, boom, 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 boom. And then Genesis two, as, as we just read, it's like the creation story starts all over and it's, it's quite different. Um, and, and so there are different explanations for this. I, I do think to some degree there is a, Genesis one is a big cosmic picture and Genesis two is a zoomed in picture on humanity and what God is doing. Uh, there is a different order of creation in Genesis two. I don't think this is like a blunder of the, of Moses or the author of Genesis of like, oh, I forgot what I wrote yesterday. Like, let's make a new story. I, I don't think that's what's going on at all. Um, again, as I talked about last week, I don't believe that Genesis 1 and 2 are trying to answer the material origins of the creation story, uh, of how everything was exactly created. Uh, we can debate about some of those things. What's really, really important about Genesis 2 is that every Christian agrees on. Humans are different than animals. Okay, and so, so in Genesis 2, when, when God breathes the breath, he forms out of the dirt Adam, the, the man, and he breathes the breath of life into him. That's not how God creates any of the animals. That, that there, there is a, a distinction. I know some of you are big animal lovers. You're like, no, 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 Brad, we're the same. We're not the same. Um, animals are gifts to us. Some are nuisances to us. <laughs> But, but, but they're not the same, and that's what, what all Christians can agree on. Um, verse eight. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or good and bad, as my seminary professor Brashears says. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which, follows, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bedellium and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The names of the third river is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Okay, so now we're getting some geography of Eden. This, this garden, so God creates man and he places him in this garden called Eden. And then um, there's this geography lesson of these four different rivers. And if you want to study it, it's wildly confusing. We don't know where this is. 
Um, so you can look for gold and all that stuff. But, but the, the, we know of the Tigris and Euphrates. The other two were like, ah, not too sure. And so plenty of different theories there. Um, but, but God places this man in the garden uh, to, to work it and keep it, as, as we'll see in just a moment. But there's two trees in this garden. There's the tree of life, and then there's the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And, and, and fascinatingly enough, it, it seems as God did not make human beings originally to be immortal. It, it was this tree of life that as they ate it, they continued to live but if they didn't eat of this, they would die, which is why after they get banished out of Genesis 3, God guards them away from the garden so they wouldn't continue to live in their sin and eat the, the tree of life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, God goes, don't eat this, right? We'll get there next week or two weeks. Doesn't go well, which is going to make sense of why this sermon is going to be kind of confusing because it's going to sound very beautiful and pretty and you're like, but what about reality? It's like, yeah, we'll get there but we're here right now. Last section we're going to read. The Lord God, verse 15, took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. That's temple language. It's only used in the Levitical priesthood temple stuff. It's amazing. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. The Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal, but for the man no helper was found corresponding to him. Okay, I forgot to write this in my notes, but let's have to address that word helper because it sounds wildly offensive to some of you. Um, women are called helper in this Genesis 2. Uh, when we think of helper, we can sometimes think of someone who is like an inferior, right? It's like, what happened to Genesis 1? I thought we were equals. Um, do you know who is called helper most in the Bible? God. God is our helper. Uh, uh, some say a, a far better translation than helper would be like an ally. And so when it says that a, a, a helper was not found for Adam, it's not like somebody who's going to clean up his dishes, <clears throat> okay? Which some of us, we think helper like that. That's not the picture. It's literally someone who helps. Who needs help? Someone with deficiencies, right? Um, God doesn't need help. We, we need help, so God's our helper. And so, so God places Adam in the garden. He places him to work it and keep it. And then um, God says for the first time in the whole story, and it should catch your, if, you, if we read it just simply through, you see it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. It's not good. He, God says it's not good. What does he say it's not good to? Man being alone. When he looks at Adam and goes, you're alone, God goes, this is not good. Now this is wild because Adam has God. Oh, I mean, you have God. How could you say I'm alone? Like, wouldn't Adam be like, no, everything's perfect. I just have God. That's all I need. God goes, no, 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 no. You were made in the image of a triune relational God. You need people. You, you, you need someone else. And so he then creates the animals and begins to parade them before Adam to name and for Adam to figure out whether or not any of them are corresponding partners. This is like a real life Tinder app where God <laughs> brings before like a giraffe and Adam's like, no, swipe left. A bald eagle, swipe left. Chimpanzee is like, eh, close but not, swipe left. Um, God's like, no, just kidding, put you to sleep, and then he's going to make Eve, and we'll get there in a couple weeks. 
But right now, what I want to focus in on, what it means to be a human being, because on these first two pages, what we're, what we're beginning to grasp is what does it mean to be a human, and why is it so important that we understand this? And Adam and Eve aren't created just as like random figures, that they are archetypal. They, they help us see and understand what, what humanity is all about. Um, Andy Crouch, in his book, Playing God, which I just love, I really enjoy him, and this book's tremendous. Crouch says this, there are four chapters missing from the working Bibles of all too many Christians. And these missing chapters are not some obscure ceremonial texts or dusty corners of the Royal Chronicles. Instead, they are the very bookends of scripture. The first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation. And to miss these chapters, the first two about the creation, the second two about the new creation, is to miss the whole point of the biblical story. I agree wholeheartedly. Sometimes when you hear Christians talk about the gospel, like, hey, tell me about the gospel. They're like, you're a sinner, and Jesus died for you so that you can go to heaven. It's like, is that what page one says? Like we're starting somewhere, those things are true, but that's not the story. That, that's not the whole, if we miss pages one and two of the scriptures, and then the last chapter is Revelation 21, 22, we miss the whole story. Adam and Eve don't show up and God's like, you're a sinner, you need a savior. He, he creates them as image bearers to be human beings. What does it mean to be a human being? According to the first two pages of the Bible, a human being is an image of God. A human being, you, are an image of God. Your neighbor is an image of God. Do me a favor, look to the person next to you and say, you are an image of God. <laughs> you, you are an image of God. Like, like, please hear me. I know teachers regret always doing that in class because then it gets crazy. All of a sudden it's like, what did you watch last night? Um, <laughs> You are an image of God. And, and, and if you've grown up in the church, you've heard this. But if this does not blow your mind, something's wrong. This is one of the most revolutionary truths ever understood in the history of the world. And yet, because we're living in what many call a post-Christian nation, post-Christian society, at least in Los Angeles, what, what's happened with a post-Christian society, when, we, when their Christianity used to just be more normalized, not like everyone was Christian, but just people understood Christianity a little bit better. Um, when we're post-Christian, what, what's happened is our society has generally taken some of the good ideas from Christianity that they like and then rejected the other ideas. In the words of Mark Sayers, we want the kingdom, we just don't want the king. So when we hear image of God, you might be an atheist or not a Christian here today, and you're like, yeah, amen, image of God. Um, in the sense of, yeah, we're equals, we're all special. Th this, is, this is so revolutionary, 3,500 years ago, and it still is today if we understand it. But it, it necessitates a God. It necessitates the God of the scriptures. This isn't a truth that just happens if we throw out Christianity. To help you grasp this a little bit more, um, two of my favorite atheist thinkers, Luke Ferry and then Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, Luke Ferry, in his book, A Brief History of Thought, he, he helps us see that it's Christianity, it's the Judeo-Christian worldview that, that helped change our world. He says it this way, Christianity revolutionized the history of thought. This is an atheist. For the first time in human history, liberty rather than nature had become the foundation of morality. 
At the same time, the idea of the equal dignity of all human beings makes its first appearance, and Christianity was to become the precursor of modern democracy. We see today how civilizations that have not experienced Christianity have great difficulties in fostering democratic regimes because the notion of equality is not so deep-rooted. So we just think, of course everyone's equal. Read history. That's not a no-duh thought. It's Genesis 1 and Christianity making it a world religion that people are like, oh, we're equals? Here's another atheist. You all know Harari in his book, Sapiens, which is tremendous. According to the science of biology, people were not created. They have evolved. And they certainly did not evolve to be equal. The idea of equality is inextricably intertwined with the idea of creation. The Americans got the idea of equality from Christianity, which argues that every person has a divinely created soul and that all souls are equal before God. However, if we do not believe in the Christian myths about God, creation, and souls, what does it mean that all people are equal? Evolution is based on difference, not on equality. That is a deep-thinking atheist taking his worldview to the furthest extent and going, we're not equals if there's no God. T take God out of the picture and go to somebody and be like, we're equals. It's like, no, you're not. One of you is smarter. One of you is prettier. One of you has more money. One of you has more power. One of you has more influence. You're not equal. But if you are made in the image of God, you are equal. A lion and a gazelle on the African safari, as the gazelle's running away, is not shouting, we're equals. <laughs> like, please, we're equals. The lion's like, no, we're not. And I'm about to show you. The idea that we are made in God's image is incredible. It's not obvious. It is a divine revelation. So what does it mean to be a human? It means that you are an image of God. What does it mean to be an image of God? Well, well think of it. It means you're literally to be a glimpse of God. G.K. Beale, he, he says that you are to reflect a greater reality. That's what an image does. Beale, in his book, he, he says that the, that the Greek word icon is translated from the Hebrew word image. Icon, he says, what does an icon do on your computer or your smartphone? It, it, it represents something much bigger. As you click on that icon, it ushers into existence the program with the many, many megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes that, that the icon represented, that's what you and I are. That's what we are to be. There are some massive implications about what it means to be an image bearer, but I'm gonna boil it down to five. Here's, here's, here's one of the first implications of what it means to be an image bearer. Being an image bearer of God means you're not God, okay? Um, I'm an image of God, but I'm not God. Two weeks ago, I, I overemphasized the bigness of God. As an image of God, I'm, I'm not God. In our current culture, while no one says specifically, you are God, that, that's generally what's believed. You are right, it's your truth, you do you. you you're not, you don't get to live however you would like because you're not God. You're, you're actually supposed to be representing someone else. So on one side, you're not God, but another implication is you're not worthless. You're not God, but you're not worthless. And unfortunately, in some veins of Christianity, they, they seem to not grasp the reality that you're an image bearer of God. And some Christians, you hear some Christians talk, it's like, I'm just a pathetic loser, I'm a worm, I don't deserve anything. Praise him. 
It's like, yeah. Like, do you know, like, you're an image, you're an image of God. Just a pathetic worm. It's like, no, you're not a pathetic worm. You're an image bearer of the Creator God. That's a really, really big deal. Any of you who wrestle with thoughts of low self esteem, struggle with your own self image, you're an image bearer of God. Would we understand that? Yes, is there truth that we're miserable wretches who sin? Yeah, there's part of, it's part of the truth. It's just not the whole truth. We're sinners, but we're also image bearers. And, and some of us need to emphasize one of those over the other in our own hearts, because all you hear is the other side. But you're not God, and, and you're also not worthless. You have inherent dignity as a human being. And this is, what, this is where it gets a little messy. Some theologians really want to boil down, like, what specifically is the image of God? Like, if I cut you open, can we see, like, where is the image of God? Um, Theologians in the past have sometimes elevated some ideas over the others. It's, oh, it's the rationality. What humans are rational compared to animals. Or it's their free will. Humans have an ability to make decisions that animals don't seem to be able to make. Or it's their creativity that makes them the image of God. Um, while some of those are true in aspects of it, we need to be careful with that because when a human being is in a coma or unborn and they don't have rationality or creativity does not diminish their image of God. Every human, your existence is the fact that you are an image bearer of God, not your brilliance or your creativity or your ethical standard, none of that, or else we can get into some really weird places and be like, well, they're image of God and they're not. And some theologians actually think we lost the image of God in Genesis 1 and 2 after Genesis 3. The problem with that is the Bible. Genesis 5 confirms the image of God after the fall. Genesis 9 does, 1 Corinthians 11, James 3. It's all throughout the scriptures that we are still the image of God. We're broken pictures of the image of God. It's as if the mirror has cracked and we don't do a perfect job of representing him well, but we're still made in his image. So, so two implications are we're not God and we're also not worthless. Here's another implication of being made in God's image. Every person you encounter bears God's image. Every single person. That's why I had you look at the neighbor next to you and say, you, you are an image bearer. Andy Crouch, in one of his other books, The Life We're Looking For, he says that he was stuck in the Chicago airport one day and he had a couple hours to kill and he hadn't gotten any exercise in a while, so he decided I'm gonna walk for as far as I can and just walk back and forth through the airport. But he had been dwelling on this idea that we're made in God's image and so he, he decided for, for, for the next hour he's gonna walk through the airport and every single person he sees He's going to see them as best he can as they walk by and say in his mind, image bearer, image bearer, image bearer. I try to do this as often as I can, friends. It, it will change you. I, mean, I, I want you to think, like, like I was at Costco last night, um, what are the thoughts you generally have as you're going through the aisles? Not, I, I, why are you laughing? I don't, I don't know. I have beautiful, pure thoughts about human beings. It's like, why? How did you stop and put your cart in the middle of the aisle? Like, like do you think you're the only person in Costco? Like, like, those are some of the thoughts. Like, do you not have anywhere to go? Why are we strolling? Um, do you know what happens when you, when you change that? and you see that person stopped in the middle of the aisle with their cart sideways, taking up the whole thing, and you look at them and you go, image bearer. <laughs> They're an image bearer of God. How dare I? How, how dare I be unkind, unloving, unmerciful to them? Would we be a people who constantly, wherever we are, see people, we look them in the eyes and go, image bearer. This isn't just a Christian thing. 
every single human being is an image bearer of God. This will, this will change you deeply as you make eye contact with them. This also explains why some Christians have a difficult time understanding why some non-Christians are really lovely people. The theology of image bearing is the answer. It's like in some camps, it's almost as like the good people are all Christians over here and the bad people are all non-Christians over here. It's like, first of all, have you ever met some of these people over here? <laughs> Yikes. I wish it was true. Oh, we're all just amazing. It's like, yeah, not myself, not you either. Um, but but non-Christians can absolutely be loving, kind, patient people. Why? Why? Because they're made in the image of God. And if you're, I've, I've literally seen this. Some, some, you grow up in like a weird Christian subculture that, that makes it sound like all other religions. They're all just awful people. And then kids grow up, they go to college, and they start meeting kind Muslims, generous Jehovah's Witnesses, truthful Mormons. And they're like, uh-oh, dad said they're awful. No, they're, they're image bearers of God. Now, are they perfect? No, no none of us are. But, but we, we better be able to have a, a deep theology to where you, you meet a kind and loving non-Christian, you're like, let's, well, I'm sure they're faking it. Let's really see the truth. So you know, they, they, they might be loving and kind because they're made in the image of God. And so let's, let's understand this. And, and yet with that, I'm going to constantly push back against the non-Christian idea that we don't need God or Jesus to actually keep these things a reality. I was listening to a podcast on Friday, non-Christian guy, a guy I enjoy. I've read his book and, and he he's, just seems like a nice, lovely dude, not a Christian, even says in that specific podcast, not a Christian. He was talking with somebody about the purpose of life, and he's like, the purpose of life is to serve others. And I'm just like, come on, dude. I agree as a Christian, but like, where do you get that idea from? Again, if all you are is an evolved ape, there's no God. The, the idea that you, the whole purpose of your life is just to serve others, that's not, that's not, that's, you didn't get that idea by observing the world. You, you got that through divine revelation, you kicked out the divine, and you were like, look at me, I'm smart. Because it's true, you are created to serve others. But it doesn't make sense unless the others are image bearers. If, they're not, if, if we're not all image bearers, why serve one another? There really are inequalities, and like, why should the powerful serve the non-powerful? It's like, what's the right thing to do? According to what? And so, the answer is because we're actually image bearers because you were made in God's image to be a portrait of him. Last couple things. As image bearers, we are called to represent God's rule, his presence, and his character. We, we are called to represent his rule, his presence, and his character. You saw that, let's look real quick. Genesis 1, 27 and 28 again. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Right after that, if we're like, what is that? He made them in the image of God. It would be a good question, like, what does that mean? The next verse, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every creature that crawls on the earth. There is a direct link between being God's image and ruling. John Golden Gay, who's a brilliant Old Testament scholar, he says, being in the image of God means that humanity rules over the earth. Th th that's the connection. Now, if you're like me, you hear the word rule and you just have negative connotations to it. That's not what's happening here. God is not saying rule over the animals by killing all of them. You're supposed to be a vegetarian in Genesis 1. 
So your ruling is not to destroy them. It's to help others flourish. How does God rule? Well, according to Genesis 1, He rules by creating and enabling flourishing. And He goes, now you go and do that. That's Genesis 1. We take a Genesis 3 broken world and we hear rule and we're like, all right, I'll rule like Caesar. Like, no, 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 no. We rule like God who blesses, who brings chaos into order. That's the God that we are called to represent. Um, John, uh, Psalm 8, real quick. Um, this is one of the wildest Psalms, and it's about creation, specifically about Genesis 1. Psalm 8, I'll just read a few verses, 3 to 9. David, writing the Psalm, says this, When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. David, when he's looking at creation, he's like, what do you, what do you, how are you mindful of us little humans? But then he goes back to Genesis 1, he's like, you created us a little less than God. Is that how you view yourself? I have to read it. One of my favorite quotes, Elmer Martins, he says this, based on Psalm 8. If one were to imagine a scale of one to 10 with living creatures such as beasts as one and God as 10, then so high is the psalmist's estimation of humanity, he should have to put him at eight or nine. It is God and not animals who is man's closest relative. This is what Psalm is saying, that that God created us to rule over his world, that we are made in his image, in his likeness to represent and rule over creation. Now that can be really big things and that can be really small things. It could be big things like taking care of the environment, the God who created the world. Sometimes Christians have a bad rap for people who don't care about the environment. It's like, guys, we know who created it. We should probably, now we can debate how to take care of the environment, sure. But we should all like agree that we should take care of the thing God made for us. If I make something for you and you throw it in the trash, that's offensive. (laughs) Sometimes we do that with God's stuff. He makes it and we're like, eh, garbage. Um, It could be big like taking care of the environment. It could be big like fighting human trafficking, sex trafficking. It could be big like leading a corporation, a CEO company where you're leading and you're helping bringing jobs to many and helping flourishing of the employees that work under you. It, it can be ruling like that. It can be ruling in small ways of changing a poopy diaper, bringing chaos into order. <laughs> it, it could be a third grade teacher who takes the chaos in a classroom and brings order to it. And you might think, oh, what is that? It, it's, it's imaging God. Um, it, it's, it's ruling. Uh, a friend gifted Micah and I for his birthday tickets to the Laker game this past Wednesday. And as we were in line for food, somebody had spilt a drink and it was just, it must have been like a gigantic, <laughs> it was, everything was wet. Like the whole thing was wet. And I'm standing in line and I'm looking at him like, oh, that's not gonna go well. And sure enough, a woman walks and just slips and eats it falls hard, and then she keeps walking, probably embarrassed, and everyone's just standing there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to do this. So I just go up, and I like just start taking napkins, and I just start cleaning the floor. And literally, as I'm doing this, I mean, and maybe it's just because I'm thinking about Genesis 1, but hopefully it's not, I, I'm representing God by taking what's disorderly and, and bringing order to it. No one else is, everyone else is like, wasn't me. 
Christians go, I'm representing the God who brings order from chaos, and someone's going to get hurt. And I could just stand around and be like, well, we'll see who else gets slipped and falls, and not my problem. Or I go, I don't want to see that happen again. And so here we go, and I'm not doing it going like, shame on all of you. I just get down, I I, I wipe it up as best I can so that people aren't going to slip anymore. Why? Because I'm ruling. I'm representing God. That's what Jesus would do. And you're like, that doesn't seem as cool as the fighting human trafficking, caring for the environment, and being a CEO. Doesn't matter. Wherever we are, we're called to represent him. We are his image. Sandra Richter is one of my favorite Old Testament scholars. In her book, Epic of Eden, she says this. In Genesis 1, 26 to 27, which we just read, God announces his intent to create humanity in his image. Hebrew, Salem. Genesis 5, 3, 6, Genesis 5, 3, 9, 6. It may surprise you to learn that Salem, with its cognates, is the standard ancient Near Eastern word for idol. When a polytheist, someone who believed in many gods, from the ancient world set out to make an earthly representative of their deity, understood as the incarnation of that which could not be fully incarnated, a lifeless object that must be animated by the deity, that polytheist fashioned a selem, an image. When the language of Genesis 1, 26, 27 is combined with the images of Genesis 2, 7, we see that Yahweh is presenting himself to us as a divine craftsman who is making an idol of for himself, which he himself must animate. And that idol is us. Within the worldview of the ancient Near East, the message here is clear. We are the nearest representation of Yahweh that exists. Is that how you see yourself? This is why in Exodus 20, when God gives the Ten Commandments, and the second commandment is, you're not to make an image of me. Why? Because God already did. You're it. God's like, you don't need to do that again. I did it, and I did a way better job than you did. You're the image. You're the idol. Don't make another. Is that how you view, do you view yourself as a representative of God's presence and his rule and his character in your workplace? That's what you're created for. People are like, I don't have meaning in my life. Like, you need to understand page one of the Bible. And this doesn't matter where you are, how much power you have, how many followers on Instagram you have, none of it matters. You're an image bearer of the king. You represent his rule, his presence. Everywhere you go, you should be bringing the presence of God so much so that when people see you, they go, God, like I want to know him. One of my favorite stories with the church in San Diego, one of the gals who was there who wasn't a Christian, she'd started hanging out in one of our gospel communities. She'd experienced such a beauty in the Christian community that one night she says this sentence, She says, I still don't know where I'm at with God, but if he's anything like you people, I want to know him. I was like, yes! Like, we did it! that's, that's, That's your whole goal in life, for people to get to know you so well that when they're with you, they might be like, I still don't know about this Jesus guy. But man, your life is compelling. And if he's like you, I want to know him. And you and I go, I'm just a glimpse. I'm just an image. Like he's infinitely better. But my job is to showcase him. Like, Like that's why you're here. That's why your life has meaning and purpose no matter what you feel about it. You're also created to be in a dependent relationship upon him. He says it's not good for man to be alone. You you aren't an image bearer of God imaging him well if you're trying to do life by yourself. The loneliness epidemic that is very real in our world testifies to a bunch of people who think that they can do life by themselves. And I know it's not just their fault. Our world is just, it's a mess. 
And deep relationships are hard to do. But they're essential because you're made in the image of a relational God. It's not an option. Because you're made in the image of God, you need him and you need people to do life with. Some of you are like, I'm good, I just got God. God looks at that and goes, it's not good. You're alone. You, you need others because you're marked with his image. In Mark 12, Jesus is tested by the religious leaders of that day. They, they weren't a big fan of Jesus. Some people were big fans. The religious leaders were threatened, jealous. It was a mess of things. And some believed he, he was really a heretic, and so they were trying to get rid of him. They bring to him a question to trap him. They say to Jesus, hey, are we supposed to pay our taxes to Caesar? And this is a brilliant question. In front of a crowd, Jesus is about to be outed. If Jesus says, yes, pay your tax to Caesar, he's supporting the Roman government that's de just demolishing Israel, who's taking advantage of oppressing Israel. So if Jesus, this Messiah figure, says, yes, pay your taxes, he's a sellout. But if he says no, he can get into a lot of trouble with the government and they'll take care of this guy. So, so they trap him. Yes or no, Jesus, should we be paying our taxes to Caesar? Jesus, brilliant, says, um, let me see the denarius. Let me see the coin that we pay the tax to Caesar. Does anyone have one? Fascinating, Jesus doesn't have one on him. <laughs> and the religious guy's like, yeah, here. And Jesus takes the coin and, and he says, whose image is on this coin? And they say, Caesar's. It would have had a picture and engravement of Caesar's bust, his head. And Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Whose image is on the coin? Caesar's, let him have it. Whose image is on you? God, you belong to him. Give him everything, live for him. And if you don't, you've missed the whole purpose of your life. Colossians 1 says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You wanna know what God is like? Look at Jesus, he's the only one who's perfectly revealed God to us. You and I will fail miserably, we all have. But in John 14, when, P, when uh, Philip goes, Jesus, show us the Father. Jesus goes, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's a bold move. Like if you're like, hey Brad, can you show me God? I'm like, look at me. <laughs> You'd be like, easy, easy with that image of God theology. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus can do it because he's God in the flesh. And by his grace, when we as image bearers failed miserably, Romans 3.23 says, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean we like failed a morality test. It means we failed to image him well. And morality is part of that, absolutely. But we failed to image him well. And instead of him scraping us off, instead of him just going, you guys failed miserably. Maybe I'll try the giraffes. Let, let's try it something else. He comes to earth to redeem us, to make us new creations, to show us what we could be like if we would receive his spirit. We cry out for forgiveness, go forgive us for not imaging you well. Make us new and he does. And now we follow him and enter into the kingdom life and become like him so that people can look at us and go, if you're anything like God, I, I wanna know him. Would we be a people who take seriously the fact that we are made in God's image, that your purpose is to represent, reflect him beautifully? Your life has purpose and meaning. Would we take that seriously? Let's pray.
Jesus, thank you. What a precious gift you've given to each of us. That you've marked us with your image that, that no one can take it away from us. Not an abusive parent. Not an ex-spouse. Not a mean coworker or manager. No one, Lord. Would you free us up, Holy Spirit, would you fill us up to live the life we were created for? Not just for ourselves to do whatever we kind of want, but, but to reflect and represent you beautifully wherever we go. Every step we take, that we be taking back space for the kingdom of God. Jesus, I pray for everyone here, especially those who, who have such a hard time believing this. God, who, who see themselves as just broken, tarnished, pathetic, loser, whatever it is, the words that they use over themselves. Lord, would the, your voice be louder than theirs? Would your voice be louder than the Satan's? That when you see them in their original creation, you say over them, very good. Lord, heal our broken world, heal our broken selves. experience more of your abundant life as we step out and represent you well to a hurting and broken world. We love you. We trust you in your beautiful name. Amen.